so we're moving up the level of organization like we talked about in the first week of class. remember we talked about things start with the atoms, then they come together to form molecules, molecules come together to form cells, cells come together to form tissues, right? So we're moving up the level. We talked about the chemistry, that was the atoms and the molecules part. Then we talked about the cell. We talked about a lot of processes within the cell, right? Like the cell metabolism and the DNA replication, transcription, translation. So now we're going into the, the next level. Different cells working together. So if we look at a particular tissue, which we studied in lab, we talked about a real tissue, muscle tissue, right? All the different connective tissues like bone and cartilage. Um, those are groups of cells with a common function in a common location. So we have four major classifications. Again, we talked about that in lab as well, looking at epithelial, connective muscle, and nervous. What each classification has in common are some basic functions. And one is epithelial tissues tend to cover and line. So they cover our organs, they line our body cavities, and they also line our hollow organs. That's epithelial tissue. So they always kind of butt up against something, like in the lining, the inside lining of your bladder. That's a special type of epithelial tissue, and it's in contact with the urine. The inside of our blood vessels is simple squamous epithelium, and that's in contact with our blood. So we have special mucous membranes, which is an epithelial tissue that's in contact with the air we breathe, with the digestive contents that come through our, our intestinal tract. Those are all epithelial tissues that line the inside of our organs. They also cover the outside of organs. When we look at connective tissue, that's primarily support. So it supports our body, like bone definitely supports our, our body, right? Gives our muscles something to attach to. Um, we have um, a realer tissue that we talked about that's kind of like the body's packing peanuts. That's a connective tissue. Cartilage supports our joints, right, and protects our bones. So those are all connective tissues. Muscle allows for movement. It's the only tissue that can contract and change its length to pull on bones and allow movement. And nervous tissue, you know, that's the control. It sends impulses, electrical impulses to, to get the rest of the body to move according to what the brain decides or what a reflex determines is necessary. So I know the definition of a tissue. It's just a group of cells working together as a common function. And the study of tissues is called histology. So if someone is a histologist, there's someone who studies and looks at tissues all day. And, a, and we take samples of tissues all the time in the hospital setting looking for cancer. What do we call that process of sampling tissue to look for cancer? What do we call that? Biopsy, yeah. So when a person has a biopsy, they're looking at a sample of potential car you know, cancerous tissue and a histologist is going to examine that tissue looking for abnormal cells because cells make up a tissue. <clears throat> so epithelial tissue, we said it covers and lines. It forms glands and ducts in the body for, like I said, passageways are lined with epithelial tissue and it serves as a boundary between like urine and the, t the rest of the body, or blood in the rest of the body, or our digestive contents, or air coming in through the respiratory tract. So it's a protective barrier. So we're okay, but if what happens when the intestinal contents, hydrochloric acid, burns through that epithelial lining? What do we call that if it's in the stomach or the small intestine? We call that an ulcer, right? So this, this epithelial lining acts as a protective layer between deeper tissues. The same thing, what happens when we break through the lining of a blood vessel? What do we call that? Hemorrhage. Yeah, when something breaks through the lining, we call that a hemorrhage. Like a hemorrhagic stroke is when pressure gets really high in an artery and bursts that artery. That's a more deadly type of stroke than when a clot forms. Um, other times we have people who smoke with diabetes and don't control their, their blood sugars. They end up with plaque developing on the inside of their blood vessels and that damages that epithelial lining and promotes um, inflammation and blood clot formation. So epithelial tissue is a great covering. It's a great protector. What is the epithelial tissue found on our skin? What type of epithelial tissue is found on the outside of us? Stratified squamous. See why we talk about lab before lecture? So you have a little knowledge now. 
ok, so one thing we can say about that's unique about epithelial tissue that you should definitely highlight or underline or put an asterisk or an exclamation point by is that it is avascular, which means there are no blood vessels embedded in epithelial tissue. It gets oxygen, but it gets oxygen through blood vessels nearby, not embedded within the tissue. So avascular means no blood vessels. But it does have nerves. So there are nerve endings. Remember we looked at the sensory fibers that butt right up against that epithelial layer? So if something light crawls across the surface, we can feel that. But if a person with chronically high blood sugar um, has damage to those sensory receptors because the tiniest of blood vessels and the tiniest of sensory receptors are damaged by high blood sugars. So as a result, their skin, they have numbness on their skin and they have damaged blood vessels, so they have poor healing in their skin. And as a result, they end up with diabetic ulcers because they step on something and they don't know they stepped on it because they're numb on the bottom of their feet. So what do we tell diabetic patients to do or people with diabetes? to protect their feet. What would you do? What would you think would be a common sense preventative to protect your feet if you have numbness on the bottom of your feet? What? Wear shoes, yeah. Or wear slippers at least, right? Something you can slip into when you get out of bed. We had a patient come in. She had diabetes. She had infection throughout her body, high fever, really lethargic, poor respirations. They looked she had infection. Looked all over her skin. The bottom of her foot was extremely red and inflamed. They did an x-ray and they found three needles inside of her feet. And she did not even know that she stepped on these needles. She said, I knew that there were some on my dresser and that they fell on the carpet, but I could never find them. So they were embedded in her feet. She had to have surgery to go in and pull those needles out in the bottom of her feet. So talk about serious infection, right? So it's really, really important that people control their blood sugars. If they don't, they st set on this course of infection and poor blood supply and, and ulcers. And then that's why they lose their, their lower legs, right? People with diabetes end up losing from the knee down. It's because they had infection in their feet that we couldn't get control of because they had poor blood supply because of chronically high blood sugars and that numbness that they couldn't catch it early enough to know how bad the infection was. So it's really, really important if you're going into a healthcare environment that you teach your patients to please control your blood sugars. You know, if you're gonna eat cake, fine take the right amount of insulin to account for that cake. And that's what I tell like teenagers that come in over and over and over with really high blood sugars and they end up in what's called diabetic ketoacidosis, which, which puts them in the ICU because it can be deadly. And just be honest. If you're going to eat junky, be honest with yourself and give yourself the insulin required to accommodate that high, high sugar snack. Because, you know, they don't follow the rules, they don't take their insulin, and then they end up with all these problems. So. When we look at the cells of epithelial tissue, they're tightly packed. See all these cells here in this slide here? They're all pushed up against each other, kind of like a cobblestone walkway going up to a house. These are our squamous cells here that are flattened and they're right butted up next to one another. The good thing about, I mean, even though there's no blood supply, they do have nerves so they can feel, you know, you can feel when epithelial tissue is damaged. Um, they have the ability to undergo to mitosis to replace themselves. So that's a good thing, right? We know our skin, the stratified squamous on the surface of our skin is always sloughing off and it can replace itself. So it is able to undergo mitosis. And we're gonna find some of the other tissues are not as able to do that. But epithelial tissue can. So that's tightly packed, no blood supply, I mean no blood vessels. It does have a blood supply, like I said, from underneath but that oxygen has to diffuse to that tissue. It can't be served directly through blood vessels, but it does have nerves and can undergo mitosis. So lots of different functions of epithelial tissue, protection, like we said, our skin. Where do we see absorption? Where do we see epithelial cells that absorb? Say it louder, Taylor. What? Microvilli where? In the digestive tract, in the digestive tract. Filtration. We see that in the kidneys. When we're pushing things by pressure, that happens in the kidneys. Excretion, a good example of that would be through the surface of our skin. We excrete sweat. Some of our wastes happen on the surface of our skin, like urea is found in our sweat. Secretion, we secrete things into the environment. That also happens in the digestive tract. 
we secrete, and in the respiratory tract, we secrete mucus or we secrete digestive enzymes. I'm not going to hold you accountable for all these specific examples because we're going to hit the body systems and you're going to see the different tissues in each body system and what their job is. This is just a real general overview, so don't feel like you have to know specific examples. And sensory reception in the surface of our skin, right? We saw those sensory receptors. We have stretch receptors embedded in the mucosal membranes of a lot of our organs that tell our body to make a change, to kick in a negative feedback system or to get us to get up and go to the bathroom, right? When our bladder wall gets stretched, we feel that reflex causing a little twinge, a little contraction of the bladder wall, and we get up and we either inhibit it or we get up and, and go with it. So we'll get into the details, like I said. Now remember, epithelial tissues have a first name that tells us how many layers are present. We talked about that in lab. And the second name tells us the shape. So we have simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar one layer and it tells us the shape flattened cells square cells tall rectangular cells stratified means many layers right what's what is our skin the outer surface of our skin made up of again stratified squamous good so there's some pictures of the different types of epithelial tissue and we're going to get into some of these uh, most of them we're going to get into all of them except for simple cuboidal i'll refer to that a little bit that's found in the kidneys but for the most part, we'll get into the different organs and we'll talk about those different types, especially in lab. We'll take a look at those in lab. Why is columnar to stratified? Because some, um, it depends on how it looks. It looks like it's stratified just because it's so tightly packed and some of the nuclei are, are lower in the cell than compared to others, but it's not really stratified. It just looks different, yeah, yeah, but it looks different than um, simple columnar. Good question. So simple squamous epithelium, one layer of flattened cells, the benefit of that is we have rapid crossing of materials. If you had to jump over a brick wall that was one thin layer of brick, it would be easy to jump over, right? But if we had many, many layers, a very thick brick wall, it would take a while, right? So. The same thing happens here. If we're trying to diffuse something from one area to another, say across the, the membrane of your air sacs of your lung, the alveoli, we, wanna, we want that to go quickly. So when that air enters into your respiratory tract, we want that oxygen to diffuse quickly to the blood. So our tiniest of blood vessels, our capillaries are simple squamous, our alveoli are simple squamous, so we have rapid exchange of gases to keep us going, right? So rapid exchange is what we would want simple squamous for. Stratified squamous, we would want protection. That's the key function of stratified squamous. Many layers allows protection. So we find this on the surface of our skin, also in the inside of our mouth. Do you ever burn your mouth eating a hot pizza? It doesn't take very long for it to heal. Maybe it burns for a day or two, or it just feels sore for a day or two, but heals pretty quickly because of the stratified squamous epithelium. And when you swallow a bite of nachos that are jagged and you're swallowing it down kind of quickly, it doesn't rip up your esophagus because you have stratified squamous epithelium. When bowels uh, move and we have stool passing through the anal canal, sometimes a person is constipated. That doesn't damage the walls because of stratified squamous epithelium. The vaginal canal. Baby passing through their intercourse, all that is stratified squamous epithelium for protection. Now, one thing about stratified squamous epithelium, those of you who have chronic damage to epithelial, it does cause cancer. It causes abnormal cell growth. When we're constantly um, creating trauma to a stratified squamous epithelial, over time, we start to see cancer. For example, drinkers who are constantly putting um, you know, high amounts of alcohol, high grain alcohol, like people that drink martinis or straight up brandy or whiskey, year after year after year, they end up with cancers of the mouth and cancers of the esophagus because it does get damaged with that chronic irritation. We know that lip cancers develop from people that chew tobacco for a long period of time because tobacco has tiny bits of glass in it to create cuts in the mucous membrane to allow nicotine to flow more readily. 
So that's just part of the makeup to you know, get people that surge of nicotine they're looking for. So over time, that causes chronic damage and causes DNA changes to those cells, leading to cancer. Um, anal, and like I said, we're talking about a lot of stuff in this class, and I don't hold back. Anal intercourse is not, um, the body is not designed for anal intercourse. So people that practice anal intercourse over a long period of time can have damage to those mucous membranes and end up with anal cancer. So um, anything that causes chronic irritation to stratified squamous cells is going to cause cancer. So ulcers, chronic ulcers, can lead to cancer of the esophagus. And that's a, a real problem nowadays that we're seeing more and more people have acid reflux at younger ages. And if they don't get that under control, they can end up with esophageal cancer. So something very uh, serious that we need to be aware of. Dam chronic damage can lead to that. So that's epithelial tissues. Connective tissues, what's unique about them, I have it in red, so obviously it's something that's going to be on the test, is they have an extracellular matrix. So any cell, any connective tissue you look at is going to have, so here's my tissue slide. So I'm just taking a chunk. It's going to be solid stuff, but I'm always going to see a cell and the stuff in between that, this, that these cells make. So in the case of here, we have hyaline cartilage. It makes the cartilage, the rubbery stuff that you feel when you're eating chicken, right? That's, that's kind of transparent, rubbery-feeling cartilage. That's secreted by these special cells called chondrocytes, and they make this, this matrix. It's kind of like soup. Remember we talked about fish eye soup? Well, the fish eyes are the cells, the chondrocytes, and they make this stuff in between that's supportive and serves a specific function. So the stuff in between the cells is the non-living part. It's just created by the cells of that tissue. So we call that matrix, okay? So if you have a bunch of people in a pool, the pool water is the matrix, the matrix, the people are the cells, okay? They didn't make the pool water, but that's just the best example I can think of. So we talked about uh, connective tissues. Um, a lot of them are supportive. Then we have cartilage, bone, and blood. Blood is actually connective tissue because we have red blood cells. And what do we call the matrix of blood if it's a connective tissue? What's the soup that the red blood cells and white blood cells are floating in? It's plasma. Yeah, plasma. It's the only connective tissue that flows through the body. So the different connective tissues, you know, there's a lot of different functions of them. This is a realer tissues. So number one, um, the body's packing peanuts. Number two could be dense, irregular, collagenous, fibrous. Supports and assists movement. Well, that would be bone, and then I have them all listed here. And again, we're going to get into the different body systems, so I'm not going to ask you to, to know specific functions of different connective tissues, but I do want you to know specific characteristics. So when we look at different connective tissues, we look at what are the protein fibers those cells make. So the cells make collagen or elastic fibers or reticular fibers. Some of them make special protein fibers or fluid. So again, matrix, know this definition. So loose connective tissue, again, it's the body's packing peanuts. When a person has edema, dinner last night. So that's the, a realer tissue in your, under your skin, right, in the hypodermis that's soaking up excess fluid that's leaking out of your blood vessels because you absorb too much salt, which pulled water into your blood vessels, and it's leaking out into your tissues. Then eventually your kidneys are going to kick in and say, we got too much fluid in this body. We need to turn on the waterworks and urinate out this fluid. And people will notice that. You'll feel puffy one day, and then the next day it's like, man, why am I going to the bathroom so much? I'm not even drinking that much today. Well, that's your kidneys telling your body to dump that excess fluid. And that's how a healthy body works. But if you have kidney damage or you have heart failure and too much fluid on board, then you just get bigger and puffier and puffier and blood pressure goes up. Then you come and see us in the hospital, right, and we put you on a medicine to get the kidneys to work a little stronger and we get those patients to pee out a lot of fluid. And it's called Lasix. Have you ever heard of Lasix or ferrosamide? Those of you in the healthcare environment? 
yeah. Patients need to use the potty a lot more when they get that. Sometimes doctors don't pay attention. They prescribe that at bedtime. Not a good plan, right? If someone is a lift or a assist of two to the toilet and they don't have a Foley and they won't use a bedpan or can't use a bedpan, it's a real problem. It creates a fall risk, actually. So that's found everywhere in the body. It's the most abundant tissue. Connective tissues, dense connective, we found that in ligaments and tendons, so it's really strong, but it has a poor blood supply. So ligaments and tendons don't heal very well because they don't have that great of a blood supply. Adipose, cushioning, and energy storage. So when we are not um, having access to food, if you have excess adipose tissue on board, you're going to live longer if there is a famine than someone who has started out very thin. So these cells have a, have a fat droplet in the middle of them. They look kind of like chicken wire, we said. But again, looking at the function, the key thing I want you to know is that we cannot decrease the number of fat cells we have. We can only decrease their size. So we can only increase or decrease their size, not their number. So when someone goes on a diet, they're just shrinking those fat cells, not decreasing. The only procedure that gets rid of fat cells is called liposuction. Yeah, that's the only way we can decrease fat cells. So it's important that we, that we think about what we're serving our kids and what kind of eating habits we're promoting in our kids. If you're a mom or a babysitter or whatever, um, you can give advice, nieces and nephews. If you're only serving your kids junky food like mac and cheese, hot dogs, burgers, pizza, you know, chips and cookies, and that's all they eat, what are their preferences going to be, do you think, when they're adults? The same thing, right? Because that's all you raise their taste buds to accommodate. If we don't introduce foods to our kids, a variety of foods like vegetables and other foods, they're not going to look for that as adults, and we're going to contribute to the obesity ep epidemic as, a, as adults. So it's really important we get our kids to eat a variety of foods. And it's just like your dog or cat. We should not have a fat dog or cat, because who's putting the food in that bowl? And that dog or cat is not outside hunting and filling its belly with fatty vermin, right? So if you have a fat dog or cat, it's on you to give it the right food. It's the same thing with our kids. Kids will eat what you serve eventually, they may boycott it for a while, but we got to be smarter about that. And think about this tissue. It's not going to go away. Once they're done with puberty, what they've created in childhood is there for the rest of